Thank you. Next speaker is Arno Godeke. He will talk about high temperature superconductors for commercial magnets. So, welcome. Um, I'd like to, uh, to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here um, about the high temperature superconductors for commercial magnets. Um, so when I thought about a subtitle, because this, this title is pretty broad, I, I found the word contemplation, which I really liked. Uh, contemplating means um, you pretend to do something, but you're actually not doing a lot. Um, so while I was, uh, let's see if the, yeah. While I was contemplating about this talk and what to tell, um, let's see, I need a point. <laughs> So when I was contemplating about this talk and, and what I should tell, um, I, I looked at what was done before. And there was a very good topical review quite recently by Davide Ugleetti in Superconductor Science and Technology. That's very complete, very uh, logical. You can read that and learn more from that than I can tell you in 45 minutes. Um, then there was a talk at UCAS by Satoshi Awaji. Um, for superconductors and high-field magnets now and in the future. So today I thought, uh, let's look at HTS magnets from, uh, HTS conductors from a magnet perspective. Um, so I made a little agenda here. Um, I don't think you can talk about HTS conductors without looking at the competition, which is a low temperature superconductor. So there's a little section on that. Um, then I will introduce the high temperature superconductors just concisely. Um, and then the core of the talk is really about HTS and how to use it in magnets. Um, and then I'll end with a interesting slides about guts. Um, so if you look at low temperature superconductors, um, you have what is used in magnet is niobium 3 tin uh, here and niobium titanium here. And you see that this is limited to typically about uh, 14 something Tesla, uh, nine Kelvin for niobium titanium, and uh, 28 Tesla or so, and, and 17 Kelvin for niobium 3 tin. Um, you can also look at that in, in terms of current density. So you, you have a current density for niobium titanium that sits out here for 1.9 Kelvin, four Kelvin here. Uh, niobium 3 tin is behaving like so. So you can build magnets in this area with, with niobium 3 tin, but not with niobium titanium, et cetera. You get the point. Um, the point is niobium 3 tin is far from exhausted. So this niobium 3 tin material is an old uh, friend of mine. Um, and if you look at the further potential of niobium 3 tin, um, then you can, if you plot the engineering current density as a function of field, um, you can either improve the pinning, which raises this JE, or you can improve BC2. Uh, so pinning enhancement, what does that mean? This is a classical example of, or textbook example of type two superconductivity where you have, now because of lattice, uh, it's fluxoids that penetrate the superconductor and they uh, have a typical spacing at five Kelvin, uh, five Tesla of about 20 nanometers. Um, in order to, if you apply current through this material, then these, these fluxoids start to wander off, they move around, um, and that causes losses. So it's not really superconducting at that point. So you need to keep them in place, and you do that by introducing discontinuities in the superconducting wave function, which is just um, non-superconducting materials in the, in the material uh, that should have a, a similar uh, spacing as the fluxoids in the ideal case. Um, for niobium titanium, however, so this is niobium titanium, where that is really the case. People have optimized this material to the extent that um, the discontinuities here in the material really match the flux line lattice. Um, for niobium titanium, um, a typical grain size is about 150 nanometers, and typically it's used at around 12 Tesla or so, where the flux line spacing is 12 nanometers. So that means that there is not enough um, bad spots in the material to, to really pin down the fortresses. Um, 
Um, so if you look at this in, in detail and, and you say, how much can the pinning force be? The pinning force is determining the critical current. Um, you see that in, in current Niobium 310, it peaks at 20% of HC2, which is around five Tesla, whereas you want to operate it here at about 50% of HC2. Now you can calculate if the grains would be as small as the flux line spacing and we we'll match it that you get this um, a pinning curve and you get enormous gains in current density at 12 Tesla and at 20 Tesla. So this is something that, that I pushed for a long time. It's not my idea. It was um, originated from Dan Dietrich at uh, Berkeley lab. And eventually this was demonstrated why it is now is slowly being implemented in, in practical uh, superconductors. So the other potential is that you increase BC2. So this is a rather um, a complex picture. This is the Niobium 10 lattice. So you have the tin atoms here. Um, it's, it's a BCC lattice. And so you have the niobium change, which are the actual superconductor along these uh, planes here. Um, so now if, the, if you deform this superconductor, you, you apply pressure on it. Um, you, you, what you find is that the, the critical current behaves like roughly like so. Um, so it really reduces a lot if you apply pressure, if you distort from cubic to tetragonal, so really uh, cause uh, anisotropic uh, distortions, you really see the critical current collapse. Um, so what we found is that um, uh, the um, application of strain on the outside basically causes a sub lattice distortion and an aerobin change, and that is really reducing the density of states, and that is reducing HC2, and that is reducing DC. Um, so you could, you know, so this is a, a calculated plot of, of the critical fields as a function of critical temperature. And you see that in, in, um, as you optimize it, um, the both go up, you, you, you optimize it by uh, improving the material purity and, and uh, tin concentration. Um, and you reach 30 Tesla and at a high tint concentration where the material is almost optimized, you get a spontaneous cubic to tetragonal distortion. This is simply strain. And this causes HC2 to dramatically collapse. So you can say, okay, what if this doesn't happen? What if I can stabilize this uh, sub lattice? I can basically uh, retain a cubic lattice. Then you find that you can gain some five Tesla in BC2 for an iron to tin. Um, so you can ask your question, okay, what do we do if we want to improve high magnetic fields? Do you invest in new magnet technology uh, using HDS or um, do you open a can of PhD students that study this in detail? So enough about Niobium 310 and low temperature superconductors. Um, why do we want to use um, high temperature superconductors in magnets? Uh, this is a slide I, I, I basically uh, copied from, from Tiva, and it basically has all the points that I want to make, so it was easier than copying that and generating it myself. Um, the first thing is that the, the pinning force in HTS conductors is a lot larger than the Niobium 310 and, and, and Niobium Titanium, so you, you really pin down these vortices a lot better than you can do in low temperature superconductors. That gives for a very stable superconducting behavior. Um, secondly, as you raise the temperature, the um, heat capacity goes up dramatically. So you, you gain buffer for any thermal disturbance that is in the material. Um, thirdly, your um, heat conductivity increases dramatically. So that means if you generate locally some heat, um, then it's transported out way quicker. So overall, you would expect that HDS magnets are much, much more stable to operate, and especially if you do that at 20 Kelvin. Um, so there are some HDS applications uh, out, outside in the field and that have become really commercial, and it's a really an emerging field, I think. Um, I'm not going to do this in detail because Yad Mellon is giving a presentation in plenary on Sunday, um, specifically on this subject. Um, but you see, you have NMR magnets. So this is uh, uh, so low temperature superconductors are, are limited to about uh, one gigahertz. So uh, the NMR magnet that NIMS was the first to surpass that. Um, this uses uh, bismuth two 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 three inside, um, inside and outside of uh, low temperature superconductors. Um, there is a Brooker which is now commercially available. 
Um, interestingly, they've been selling these systems while they had the technology not completely ready yet. So, um, but this uses a Repco conductor on the inside. Um, there is some, some MRI work uh, going on. This is a Kyoto University, a three Tesla MRI uh, system that uses Business 323. Um, there is a commercial uh, company in Germany that makes uh, one and a half Tesla MRI systems, also for my systemic superconductors. Um, there's user magnets. This is a conduction cooled magnet that is sold by Sumitomo Electric Industries, typically five to 10 Tesla. Um, there are some interest in particle, uh, particle therapy for uh, using uh, superconductors to improve the, uh, make the systems more compact. I will show that more in detail on Monday. I have a presentation on that. Um, and there's Fusion, which is, which is a big hype at the moment. Fusion wants to um, uh, make compact machines, much more compact than the ITER machine in Kadarash, and make that commercially and then sell a lot of these systems. Um, it's, it's really funded well uh, in the US, Commonwealth Fusion Systems has about 200 million of uh, private funding. And in the UK, uh, Tokamak Energy is, is, is getting a lot of money from the British government who really want to push this forward. Um, so let's introduce our high temperature superconductors. So this is um, a picture I, I, I borrowed from uh, Davidi's uh, very good review. Um, you have basically three options. You have bismuth 2223, which is um, a silver alloy matrix. And with uh, bismuth 2223 filaments um, inside an a, a silver um, matrix here. Uh, so you have silver here in the proximity of 2223 and a silver alloy on the outside. And you can reinforce these conductors by soldering uh, metal strips on the outside. Um, 2212 is a round wire. It's the same principles here, except uh, 2223 you need to squeeze and make into a tape in order to get good performance. Um, you can have 2212 as a round wire. Um, and then you have Repco superconductors, which is basically a substrate, usually Hastelloy. And you deposit a buffer layer on that, and then you grow basically a single crystal. Um, very often, each from copper oxide or some other rare earth. Um, this is basically a single crystal that you need to make by, you know, a kilometer length uh, at four millimeter width or so. So this is really uh, thin film technology or thick film technology. And then you cap it with a protection layer and, and some copper to, to make it thermally uh, electro stable. Um, you have one manufacturer outside uh, in the field of, of 2223. Uh, at the moment, two manufacturers of 2212 and uh, about eight manufacturers of Repco. And I put question marks here because these, these manufacturers basically come and go um, as the market uh, appears or disappears. Um, so this is typically uh, about four millimeter wide tape, a quarter of a millimeter thick. Um, it's multifilamentary, which is important, uh, but these filaments are not twisted. So you want to twist those filaments for AC loss and stability. Uh, this is a pre-reacted conductor. You can buy these and you just wind it into a coil and it would should work if you did your homework. Um, you have for 2212, you have round and rectangular wires of various dimensions. It's multifilamentary, this can be twisted. Um, and very often this needs to be wound and then heat treated. And you need to do that heat treatment at 890 degrees C in oxygen uh, with very high accuracy and sometimes under pressure. So this is absolutely not trivial if you want to do that. Um, some options, uh, people are thinking now about making pre-reacted to the one two. Um, Repco is also, you know, it's not pre-reacted. It's, 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 it's a tape that has a thin film that, that works. So you can just coil it up. You can get it in two to 40 millimeter wide sizes, and it's, it's quite thin, uh, 50 micrometer to 200 micrometer. Um, it's very high strength usually because the, the, the substrate material is high strength. Um, so if, if you look in detail of how these conductors are manufactured, this is 2223, manufactured by Sumitomo Electric. Um, basically, you take your starting power dish, um, you mix them and you pack them into a silver tube. Um, this silver tube you draw down and you have this, this mono billet, a monofilament that you restack to 
get a multi-filament wire. And then you draw this down further, then you roll it, and you roll this to get some, some texturing. Um, then you do some heat treatment, you roll it further, and then you do an overpressure centering at high temperature at 8 or 90 C or something. Um, they make two versions of this conductor. One is type H, the bare conductor, and the other one is, is where the matrix is allowed with, with gold, and um, they, they do that to increase the thermal resistance so you can use it for current leads. Um, another thing they do is they take their base wire and they solder basically reinforcement strips on this uh, conductor. And what you get by that is that if you, if you do a tensile test and you measure the critical current, then you see that uh, as you add these lamination layers, so this is stainless steel, copper alloy, and some nickel alloy, uh, this gets increasingly stronger. So you really, this is something that you want in the magnet. You want a strong conductor. Um, I, I leave, so. Um, I leave the details in this, this plot here for, for you to read uh, afterwards. Um, so there is there is recently some some transverse pressure experiments done, and you find that if you press on this tape on the flat side, you you find something like 250 megapascal above which the uh, critical current collapses. Um, uh, <laughs> it's really sensitive. Um, so another thing to point out is that this is uh, typically produced in up to a kilometer length. And here up to 500 meter length. The reason this is not really limited. I mean, it, it just depends on the size of your billet. The big billet will give you more wire. It's a continuous process. Um, this is mainly limited by the size of the heat treatment furnace here at the end. Um, how big a spool can you put in there? Um, this, this limitation comes from the, the, the lamination that we put on. So you imagine a nickel, high strength nickel alloy that you want to purchase in. in what is it 30 micrometer thickness? That's not something you can buy off the shelf. It needs to have high homogeneity. So this is more limited by the lamination than by the uh, conductor. Um, recently, um, Sumitoma has been improving the stainless steel version and the uh, nickel alloy version by, by increasing the thickness. If you make it thicker, it becomes stronger. Um, you gain more strength in your lamination. Um, which is something that is really applauded in the industry. I mean, in the magnet industry, you want more and more strength. Um, so if you look at cables um, from 2223, up to recently, they didn't exist. I mean, they had cables for utility industry, power cables that transport AC current or DC current. Um, but they were not really magnet cables. And the reason is you want these magnet cables to be really dense. They have a high JE. Uh, they need to be mechanically stable. They need to be transposed. That means that all the strands, all the filaments, or all the tapes that you have in the conductor will see the same field um, and carry the same current. They need to be flexible. You need to be able to wind a coil. Uh, and it needs to be scalable. You want big cables or small cables. So recently, uh, about two years ago, three years ago, um, Solid Material Solutions came up with a novel idea. They used um, the, the strength of this. Uh, nickel alloy conductor from Sumitomo. Um, and you, you, they found that you can do a hard way bend in this conductor. So you bend it in the direction it does not want to bend. Um, so what they do is they take um, a couple of these, or two or more of these tapes, and they stack them. Then they put some edges on that. And then they really cable this. They put it so if you look in this picture, this, this stack goes there. So this that goes there. So you, you kind of rotate. And in that way, you transpose this, this conductor. And you can only do that because this conductor survives this hard way bend because it's so strong due to the lamination. Um, so here you see that sketched again. You have, let's say, two or more HDS tapes. You put some, some copper sides are, uh, next to it, and you wrap it. And then you, you cable that. You bundle that into a cable, and you, you then press down on it, and you consolidate it. Um, how that looks in practice is you have here a bundle. Here is the transposed uh, bundles. Um, then you, you press a, a top layer on, or sometimes a bottom layer, and you get really a nice rectangular cable that can carry a lot of current and is rather really strong. Um, 
So on two, two, one, two conductors, they, these are manufactured by Brooker and by solid material solutions. Um, so Brooker is, 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 has bought Oxford Superconducting Technology in the US and they've been making 2212 um, for many years and very solid large scale production uh, of round wires. Um, the, the process they use is very similar to for 2223. It's a powder and tube process again. And they draw typically, you know, you can start with this diameter and draw it further down. So you can have different diameter wires and you can um, grade your magnet, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, they found that um, if you heat read these, you, you, you have void fractions in the, in the superconducting layer, what you need in order to be able to draw wires. Um, so these void fractions are, are accumulate as you do the heat treatment and you get these big blobs, these big voids in your superconductor and they block the current. So you can mitigate that to some extent if you overpressure heat read it. So you don't heat read it at one bar, but you heat read it at 50 bars. Um, the IC will roughly double if you do that. But of course, for, for a coil, a magnet. Uh, <laughs> do we have another one? Or do we have another remote? Because this is a bit uh, funky. Um, so you have, you have all kinds of challenges if you want to use this as a magnet. Uh, first is the reaction, the heat treatment that you need to do, which needs to be within one to five degrees at around 8 or 90 C in oxygen. So this is really nasty for anything that, that you want to use as insulation or construction material. Um, it's ceramic insulation, it's usually in canal construction materials, etc. And if you really want the highest DC, you need to heat treat it at uh, increased pressure. Um, so we have the large scale manufacturer here, and here is a, a, basically a startup company that's been around now for 10 years. They really look into novel ways of making this conductor. Um, they want to focus on low cost high JE wires. And similar to what they did with 2223 is they want to um, make reinforcements on the outside of the conductor. So you either uh, bond the layer on top and bottom or you bond on the wire here around it. And you see some examples here. They also focus on some, some very specific uh, conductors that is not available which is very low loss, very small diameter conductors uh, for very high ramp rates, let's say 40 Kelvin or something. This is in interesting for motors, motor applications and uh, things like that where you have an AC uh, field. Um, if you look at 2212 cables, conventionally this is the cable for high field magnets. Uh, it's a Rutherford cable, it's very dense. Um, round wires are, are um, um, transposed along the length of this conductor. This is really the classic uh, cable that you use in magnets. Um, it's, it can be done with for 2212 because this is a round wire. This is the only conductor that is a round wire. Um, so for the other conductors that we have, uh, if, if you don't have this, this cable and you want to use, um, let's say high strength uh, conductors because this cable is going to be really really soft after heat treatment it's a silver matrix um it undergoes a heat treatment of 890 degrees c so after this heat treatment this is going to be very very soft and, and not strong so this company was was focusing on, on making these reinforced conductors also wants to make large area wires um uh, transpose cables out of this so you really get very strong and tough big cables that you can use in magnets. Um, so for Repco conductors, I, this is not really a material stock. So I'm just going to sketch um, what, what, what is out there, how they look like. Um, again, we have the substrate, we have some buffer layers, and then we have the actual HTS layer here. And then there are some, some silver capping layer and some, some copper usually around it. Um, you see, this is a beautiful slide from uh, Superox, who really show their uh, deposition uh, line with where and how um, all this is, is built up. But this makes for a very expensive process. Yeah? So you, you, the raw material cost is really low for this, but you have a very expensive process. Um, and you have only a single crystal, so it's not really multifilamentary. All these manufacturers make um, basically a, a thin film single crystal by the, by the kilometer. Um, 
So for Repco, there have been um, there's been a lot of people thinking about about cables. Um, the the first one that that was uh, that emerged was by uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Wilfried Goldbacher. He said, "Okay, I want to make a rebel cable. Um, so you, you take a wide Repco tape and you cut out uh, sections, which is of course costly, uh, and then you break this into a, a transposed conductor." And they even took that a step further and say, okay, I have this unit, I can then wind this unit around the former um, and make for a big cable. Other people have thought about, okay, you stack a bundle of these tapes and then you, you twist it basically, and then you can use that as a unit uh, for, for to build up uh, a cable. This was done by um, the Plasma Science and Fusion Center at MIT, uh, who are really interested in fusion. So they were interested in big cables. Um, there's a company in the US, uh, Advanced Conductor Technologies, who basically wraps the tape around the core and then does that multiple times and you end up with cables looking like so. Um, so the guys at Enea in Italy, they've uh, created this, this coil former, uh, a cable former out of aluminum. And then you basically stack your tapes in, this, in these slots. And there's other ideas of stacking tapes in the round tube and then uh, basically using that to make some kind of Rutherford cable. So there's all these ideas out there, but none of them is really still emerging as a, a good generic uh, layout. Um, so now I come to the core of my talk, which is, if I look at the global specifications of HTS, um, you have all these numbers for the three different options. You have uh, how they're built, um, the current density, you have the strength, and uh, the length in which it can be fabricated. So the most important parts here to me are the engineering current density, uh, which basically drives only, in my view, magnet cost. Um, if you need a certain current density and a certain volume, um, if a conductor has less current density, you need to buy more of it and use more of it. Um, what really drives magnet performance is strength. Um, so not the, conduct, the conductor mechanics and not JE is, in my view, the main driver for the performance. Um, the reason is that the current density of, of these HTS conductors is basically almost field independent compared to low temperature superconductors. Um, they have upper critical fields of 100, 200, 300 Tesla maybe. So it's, it has barely any field dependence. That means that all the designing of such a magnet is, is um, um, it's basically just, just finding a JE that works and then look at the mechanics very carefully. Um, so if you look at the, the, the price, so there's a big difference. There's a, people talk in the community about price and cost. Yeah? So the cost is what it takes to make this conductor. The price is, however, what you can buy it for. So if I go out and say, okay, I, I take some generic numbers. Um, I want a 0.8 millimeter wire or a four millimeter wide tape. You find that for niobium titanium, you pay about $1 per meter. Niobium titanium, three and a half dollars per meter. So these have been optimized. So this is a price that you can really approach as the cost to make it um, with a little profit. Um, for 2223, you typically pay around $20 per meter. Um, for 2212, it's a bit harder to find a price. So some people, this is the, the number that is roughly mentioned in the field, um, $75 per meter. And then Repco is sitting at around $40 per meter. Yeah, but really, um, price is really not the same as cost. So if I go out and, 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 and say to, to one of these manufacturers, I want to buy a conductor, the first question that the sales guy says, okay, how much do you want? Um, what's your market potential? Do you have this application that will, will use, you know, 1,000 kilometers per year? Um, what are your unit lengths? Uh, what is the performance that you need? And, and do you want us to do the quality control so we can guarantee that performance? All these things make these prices go up and down a lot. Um, if you're a really fancy, good customer, um, they really want to do something about the price. However, if you need 100 meter to wind a demo magnet, you're going to pay more. Um, so overall, you can look at this in terms of price per kilogram. Um, you see that iodine titanium is located around here. Iodine titanium is more expensive 
the Christmas conductors are more expensive even, and then the Repco conductors are the most expensive option. Um, you see the, here is the, the silver price, which is a major determinant for the bismuth uh, conductor price. Um, but one should not forget that niobium in the, in the quality for, that is used for low temperature superconductors is also very, very costly. Um, so a better way to make this comparison is if you go to look at price per kilowatt meter. So you say at a given field, this carries so much amps and they need so much of it. Um, and then you get this comparison where you have niobium 310 sitting here at four Kelvin without any, any strain that lowers the critical current. Uh, niobium 310 at six Kelvin and 0.6% and compressor strain, which is really high, but it really drops down the critical current of this material. And hence, the price per kilowatt meter is going to uh, move to lower field. Um, Repco, there's, there's people always claim it can be a lot cheaper, but okay, you need volume for that. And that but that's also true for the bismuth conductors. Um, but overall, from this plot, you see that at 4 Kelvin and zero strain, HDS becomes competitive uh, price wise at around 21 Tesla. However, if you do anything to lower the uh, critical current in niobium 15 so for example, raise the temperature, like you want to operate at 20 Kelvin now or 10 Kelvin, um, you really, really enter a field where you can be competitive to niobium 15 at a much lower magnetic field. Um, there have been some case studies specifically in the field of proton therapy for the, the, the true cost of a conduction cooled magnet system over a 20 year lifespan. So this is a a cyclotron that accelerates protons and you bend them up over and into a patient here. And for that, you can think of superconducting magnets to provide the, the magnetic field to bend these particles. Um, in this system, the peak field on the conductor is about four Tesla. And then you can, can model this and say, okay, now I have a conduction cooled magnet system. I have a, you know, a room temperature, I have an intermediate temperature and the temperature at which the superconductor operates at. And I have cryocoolers in between and I have heat dissipations everywhere and I have cost of these things. And I have superconductors in there that cost yay much. I need this, this cross section of noivin titanium to make my magnet work, et cetera, for the other conductors. And then you land at these prices roughly. And then you go and model this. Um, and you find that uh, you know all these these the overall cost, the total cost of using this conductor, is made out of uh, some some um, cryocooler capital costs, some collector costs to operate the cryocoolers, and some conductor capital costs. And you can add all these up and plot them as a function of operating temperature. Um, note that these scales are quite different. Um, and you find some minimum where it's economically the most beneficial to use this conductor. And what you find is for niobium titanium, uh, you find close to seven Kelvin, niobium titanium, you find a minimum of uh, 9.4 Kelvin, two to three at uh, 13 Kelvin roughly. Uh, Repco, you find interestingly a limit, uh, a minimum really at a very low temperature. This is really interesting because at higher temperature, everything becomes easier and more stable. Um, and it's easier to do with cryocoolers, et cetera. But you find, Cost numbers there. And if you look at those, um, you see that niobium titanium, if you use it in a conduction cooled system, is actually more expensive than niobium 310. Uh, that's due to the higher cooling needs. Um, and at the same time, you have a very low thermal margin if you want to use niobium titanium, which is bad for stability. Um, for 223, you find that it's, it's about 80K more than if you use niobium 310. So the argument of your manager will say, okay, then we pick niobium 310, but niobium 310 needs to be heat treated after you wind your coil that adds cost. And um, whereas 223, you can just coil up. And, and secondly, because this is so much more stable, it has a high te critical temperature, it's much more uh, reliable in a magnet, I think. Um, you won't have training. Training is an aspect that we'll come to later. Um, and uh, so this overall, you would, you would actually pick 223 at that point for any conduction cooled system. Um, Repco is twice the price of 223. And the reason is just basically this big uh, conductor capital cost that you see up front. Um, you can do another case study. Let's say I want a 
the proton therapy gantry magnet now sitting at seven Tesla operating field. Um, and you look at conduction code magnets. So typically a magnet, you design it around 100 to 400 amps per square millimeter uh, in the conductor. Um, if you push more, then it's hard to protect it. If you use little, uh, less current density, then it's not really useful to use superconductors. And you basically find, um, so I've, I've plotted basically all these conductors at four Kelvin and 10 Kelvin, except my over titanium, which, which you know, loses everything at 10 Kelvin. You find that all these HCS conductors basically carry enough critical current density. Um, a side to remark is that Nobin tin can carry a lot more if you do choose a different type, more expensive, and the Repco can also be a lot higher. Um, you can make this plot less um, disturbing and more visually attractive by saying, okay, now I have uh, to operate at seven Tesla um, and uh, with a field perpendicular to the tape. And uh, then you can make a plot as a function of temperature. And you see that uh, at seven Tesla and you want high heat capacity and high thermal conductivity. So you want to operate above 10 Kelvin. You see that the titanium completely stops working. Even the tin you can use, but it has barely any thermal margin, and all lights is a thermal tin. So, conduction cool designs uh, for medium field are driven by economics and the mechanics of the conductor more than JE. Um, so, I'll fly through this more quickly now because uh, <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, basically, you can look at the forces in, in magnets, and um, uh, you find that, that you accumulate a lot of transfers pressure and tension on, on these conductors. In reality, you have, of course, a hard way bend and easy way bend. You have winding tensions, you have different hoop stress, you have twists, you have loads uh, perpendicular and to the right phase of the tape. So it's really a three-dimensional complex problem. Um, if you look at the data that is out there, usually met people pull on tapes or superconductors and or they press on it. And if you do that for these, these conductors, this is actual uh, longitudinal uh, tension and compression. Niobium C tin sits here roughly. The bismuth conductors have a plateau where it's almost independent of strain and then they collapse outside of the plateau. And Repco is basically flat for Kelvin. So easy, right? You use your Repco because it's the strongest conductor. But in reality, if you look at the order load directions and you have, uh, you know, you start to pull and you start to try and delaminate it and you have shear stresses. It's actually very, very weak. So this is really a problem in magnets. Whereas the, for example, 2223 is actually three-dimensionally much more robust. So you need mechanical stability in all directions. Um, so the concurrent anisotropy, you see that, that uh, these conductors uh, have less current carrying capacity if they are field is perpendicular to the broad side of the conductor. Um, and that's basically due to the uh, anisotropy that, that is in the, in the pinning. So you can improve that. Um, people have, this is a, in motion, people can really improve this and make the anisotropy lower um, by adding pinning centers in the material. Um, you see that for 2223, the anisotropy is actually less severe. Uh, what this does is if you have a magnet and you have your field going around the corner here, your radial field, so where it points perpendicular to the conductor is actually limiting your magnet. So your very last turn in your magnet is limiting the performance of this entire thing. And you can do something about it. One option was to, to what we did in the past was to use ferromagnetic material to suck the flux away from the edge of the coil. And what people do at CERN is they basically align their conductor to the field lines. So you have only magnetic field that is parallel to the, to the conductor width. Um, and that way you utilize the maximum performance. Um, I'll skip this, take your time. Another important aspect is conductor magnetization. So if you use these conductors in field, and again, you have a radio field component here on the, on the broad side of this tape conductor that induces a screening current. And the screening current for a rep code just runs around in this single crystal. So it has a very long time constant. Um, for niobium tin, it has to, or sorry, for 2223, it has to um, cross the matrix going from filament to filament. So the time constants for 2223 are a lot shorter. 
But this is problematic in magnets because you don't it, it, it you don't get the field that you expect, and the field that you uh, get is not stable in time. So for NMR, this is really really uh, critical. So what they do is they overshoot the current. They ramp up their magnet to a certain current, and then they go a little bit further than the operating current, and they ramp back down. And in that way, they can they can remove this drift that is due to the um, dying out of the screening currents. Um, you find that this, this for Repco, you have to go to um, 5 or 12% overshoot, and you can get your NMR magnet stable. Um, for 2 to 3, you only need to overshoot by 1% in order to get this stable. That's just due to the, the matrix blocking basically these, these super currents, these shear currents. Um, How much time? <laughs> okay. Um, so if you look at HDS conductors in general, they have very low end values. I, I'm not going to go through these details here because it's a lack of time. Um, but basically an ideal superconductor has a transition very steep. And the end value, which is basically the, this power law function, the end value is there. Uh, the end value would be infinite. In real conductors, this distribution, this transition to the normal state is very gradual. And the reason is that these conductors are inhomogeneous. So we spend a lot of time improving the homogeneity in niobium 310 conductors. And uh, you form this by heat treatment. And as you heat treat it longer, here you see a niobium transition, and here you see the niobium 310 transition. This transition becomes steeper as you make the material more homogeneous. And you can see that also in terms of the critical properties, if you look at JC as a function of field, there's a band of properties right, that is due to the property distribution in these conductors. Nevertheless, um, low temperature superconductors can have an end value of about 100. In high temperature superconductors, typically that's around 20. So it's a lot lower. And what that does is, is if you want to operate, let's say at 90% of J JC, um, you see that in, in, low term, in high temperature superconductors, you already develop dissipation in your conductor. You don't want that. Um, whereas in uh, low temperature superconductors, if your magnet is designed at 16 Tesla, it's going to quench at 16.1 Tesla. You cannot do that with, with high temperature superconductors. Um, but the advantage here is that this transition is very gradual. So if you coil, if you push your coil to the limit, you will find it very gradual. Uh, transition to the normal state. Um, you can look at manufacturing yield. Um, if you look at traditional wire drawing, which is done for two to one two, you find that you can make two and a half kilometers or more. Um, you can also use traditional wire drawing in combination with these strengthened conductors. Um, if you look at two to two three, for example. Um, you can easily make 1,200 meters of type H conductor. Um, it's common good, and you can do that with a very low uh, standard deviation. And you can also make the reinforced conductors, as I showed. So for the bismuth conductors, you have conventional wire drawing, large yield, very homogeneous, multifilamentary, um, which you can also strengthen on the outside. If you look at uh, uh, Repco, um, I'm not going to make this a competitive slide. I, I got input from all these manufacturers, and you see typically along the length, you see this kind of behavior. Huh? They measure the critical current along the length of the conductor they produce. And what you find is, so this is, this is uh, from Tokamak Energy, where they purchased 55 kilometers of this stuff and did the analysis as well. Um, Superox is now producing six tons, nearly. Um, so in 2021, they have a huge capacity to scale this up. So this is all impressive progress, um, but the IC variations along the length, because this is a complex thin film technology, are pretty high on the order of 15% or more. Um, any local minima in IC you have will mean that you need to cut your conductor at that point. Um, so the actual lengths with the guaranteed IC are a lot sh shorter than what can be manufactured. So this needs very stringent quality control. So there is a concern. If I look at all these dips and I want to make a magnet, I say, okay, what if this dip 
process quality control and ends up in my magnet. Can I, can I then see this? Can I detect this? Um, so the question is, if I have a coil of, let's say, two kilometers of conductor, uh, can I detect a one centimeter bite spot or a local um, lower value of IC? So what, what drives this is the um, upper, the irreversibility field as a function of temperature. And if you sit at four Kelvin with LTS, you find you have a temperature margin of about below 10 Kelvin. Your heat capacity and thermal conductivity are low. So your normal zone that forms will propagate with some, some meter per second. So you can detect that. I, I see my chair looking at me and I'm messing up with that. <laughs> um, or two, 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 three at 15 Tesla, if you increase the field, you see that your thermal margin becomes lower. So you're then with a thermal margin of 23 Tesla, but still you are not able to detect it. What people find is, is something like um, uh, at maximum four centimeters per second on the zone propagation. Um, for two, two, one, two, if you put it in high field, you see that your thermal margin is actually very low, about nine Kelvin, still your heat capacity and thermal conductivity are low. And sure enough, if you operate at 90% of the AC, um, your normal zone propagation goes up to about 0.7 meters per second. So this is detectable. Um, I'll skip that. The only issue is that for Repco, if there's a bad spot like that, you won't be able to see it and you will burn your magnet. Um, so this, this of course depends very much of what is packaged around the conductor? How well is it cooled? Um, but, uh, yeah, I see my chair looking <laughs> more and more. So I'm going to skip um, training. I don't. We think... are in negative time. Yes. Sorry. The time remaining is negative. Okay. So basically, I think HDS magnets do not not quench and nor do they train. Um, so there's some other aspects. Superconducting joints. I'm almost at the end now. Um, you can make those. You're on the development, it's critical for NMR. Uh, current sharing in all these multifilamentary conductors, of course you get current sharing. So it's, it's the ability, if you have a bad spot in your superconductor, can it go and go around it? For Repco, you don't have that. So people wind two of these conductors in parallel or more, or you need cables. Um, I will skip grading. So let's go to my final slide about guts. Um, so, Helium belongs in my mind where it came from. Helium is sourced from fossil fuel winning. Yeah, so you, you get gas out of the ground or oil. Um, and then as a bonus, you get helium. And, and some companies might decide to store that and sell that. Um, if we're going to use less fossil fuel, there's going to be less helium. Um, and the helium that is here, if we, we evaporate it, if we blow it off in a cryostat, it disappears into space. So it's lost on Earth forever. Um, and you have, let's say, established names in the field that say, mm, this is a costly magnet, but I want it to work. So let's, let's use good old iron titanium. I, say, I think this is a very old argument uh, that is not always true anymore. Um, I think commercial magnet systems now and in the future will want to be cryogen-free conduction cooled. Um, they don't want to wind a coil and then do this complex heat treatment. They want to have pre-reactive conductor if it's available. And finally, um, the commercial future, I really think, belongs to a collection called HDS magnet. So let's just do it because operating at 20 Kelvin is cooler. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one online question. Uh, so the question is, may you comment on limitations based on mechanical fracture of two G wires originated from screening currents into G wires and how this problem can be solved? Um, so yes, what, what happens is if, if, you, um, if you have local screening currents um, and also in the case of a quench, if you heat up your conductor locally, um, you, get, you get strain locally in your coil. And this strain can, can be, become, too, so you design a coil, you say, okay, this can survive, let's say half a percent of strain. Um, 
Yeah, so I will wind my coil, I lose some of that. Um, and then I cool down, I lose some of that. Then I apply hoop stress. If you designed your coil well, then you're going to compensate for that. But at some point, you're hitting your strain limit in your conductor. And if you go beyond that, it's going to break the superconductor. Um, so what, what screening currents locally can do, and also heating up of the conductor, is basically you, you surpass that strain limit and the superconductor will fracture and you will lose your coil. I think that is roughly what would be an answer to the question. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think we should close the session now. And if you have questions, please uh, ask after the session. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, I have, sorry. <laughs>